All right. Thank you, Max. Um, is everything, is that screen is, is shared? We, are we looks, good to go? Looks thank, good. Thank you. All right, look, thank you very much. Um, look, honor, honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be here. I was absolutely thrilled to talk to this group, um, an interdisciplinary group after my own heart, um, and doing the sort of work that I've been kind of doing across my entire career. So it's, um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking about this. Um, the talk I'd originally proposed to do was on blockchain, I mean, on creative industries and blockchain. Um, I've, I've just in the process of preparing the talk in the past few days, I sort of had a few new ideas and decided to switch it. So you've got some, um, I wanna say, latest thinking rather than half-baked ideas that I want to just present to you. Um, but well, what that means is this is going to be less of a survey of where the state of um, creative industries and blockchain is, which was the original intention. Um, we can still sort of try and I'll try and sort of cover some of that. But the actual purpose of what I want to do is to actually present a bold new idea. Um, it, it, it may or may not be stupid. I don't know. Well, that's what we'll find out in the next hour or so. Um, about the direction that a, a research proposal for where, where I think cultural science should go. And the short answer to it is towards blockchain. So that's kind of the, what this talk is going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll dig into my reasoning behind that um, as we go through. Um, what I hope to do as well is um, after this talk, get some feedback, write this up as a, as a paper, um, submit it to the Cultural Science Journal. And when that goes in, it'll also go in with Ali Rennie, um, who has... Um, a, also a sort of cultural scientist um, I've been working with for a long time who's we've been discussing this idea together so that's the that's the sort of context of of the the title um, the the other thing I'll just note in starting is um, as Max said I'm an economist um, I've I you know I, I work as a as, as an economist that specializes in long-run economic growth and innovation and economic evolution um, which basically means the economics of innovation an institution. So that's 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 sort of my professional background is that the sort of economist studying the question of why economies grow. Um, and the short answer to that question is new ideas, knowledge. Um, so the my career more or less has been devoted to trying to unpack that what then causes innovation and how do we understand the nature and causes of innovation. And about 15 years ago, one of the sort of answers that I got particularly obsessed with was the role of the creative industries in that story. So the standard sort of economic answer to where does innovation come from? The answer is industrial innovation from new technologies, where the new technologies come from um, science and, and, um, and industry and through investment and in startups and in, in, in new tech and so on. And the, the thing about that answer is it's most, it's sort of correct. Um, it's, it's correct. In, in the sense that you, you see a lot of that, but it was missing one big chunk of stuff. Um, the question was, what was going on then in the creative industries, music, art, film, television, um, song, publishing, um, the, the broad sort of service sector, a, a large sector of the economy, an enormously creative sector of the economy, an innovative sector of the economy, but as far as a co innovation economists were concerned, it didn't exist. And that seemed weird to me. So I started getting interested in the question, the specific question of what do the creative industries, um, cultural industries slash creative industries contribute to the sorts of innovation that economists care about as the sorts of innovation that drives long run economic growth and transformation. So what was going on there? Um, 15 years ago, that was more of an original question than it is now. Now we're, we're sort of a lot more comfortable with the idea that what we're observing is um, this process of you know, the growth of knowledge that is being driven through um, cultural assimilation and creation of new ideas and, you know, and, and a, a sort of a much broader understanding of that in terms of not just creative industries, but creative cities and creative classes and just create just the, a, a broader understanding of the role of creativity and education and so on in that. Um, now that I mean, and again, um, I'm sure I'm not telling anyone um, in this audience anything they don't already know or have done multiple PhDs on. Um, where that led me to was this idea of cultural science. And that was the sort of first sort of, I think, really new idea that we had in that, in that agenda. And that was done with my colleague, um, John Hartley. And what we did there was we, we more or less just took the idea of cultural studies um, in the sort of Raymond Williams um, humanities idea and merged that hard with evolutionary theory. 
and evolutionary methodologies and complexity theory and complexity methodologies. So, I mean, I, I was familiar with that as an evolutionary economist. We'd take an evolutionary theory and put it together with economics to create evolutionary economics. We did the same thing this time with cultural studies, and that was a more radical undertaking. And the um, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment what we did with that. Um, I did that for about five years, took me up to about 2014, 2015, and then I abandoned that and went on to my next thing, which is institutional crypto economics. And that's basically a blockchain economist. Um, it might, on the face of it, seem like a wild um, left or right turn or whatever away from this. But the argument I want to make today is that this is a completely consistent next step. And this is the, the point I want to make. So what that looks like, um, just to check slides, we're, on, we're seeing a slide, the big idea. Good. All right. So what that looks like, um, the big idea here is, is um, cultural science, um, as represented in this book, um, Natural History of Stories, Deans, Knowledge and Innovation, which was cultural studies plus evolutionary theory to tr really try and address that question of not just how do we do the, culture, the creative industries question, how does creative industries drive innovation? But the deeper question, how do we build a new science out of that? How do we just go underneath that and understand the role of storytelling and, um, and the role of, of, of group making and, and, and just, you know, cultural analytic concepts in this sort of, this, this attempt to understand innovation, that's cultural science. Um, what I want to do is connect this to blockchain. And again, on the face of it, this might seem a really strange thing to do. Blockchain is computer science and accounting. Um, that seems to be a very, very long way away from, from, from what cultural study, from what cultural science and creative industries and complexity theory were trying to do. But the, the point I want to do in this talk, and I'll do it, I'll introduce the whole idea once, then I'll go deep into blockchain, explain that, and then come back again. So we'll see this idea twice, is something that is I don't know what to call it. Crypto cultural science sounds a bit twee, um, but it's it's basically um, a sort of Web three version of cultural science, or what I think is a, co a coherent Web three version of cultural science. And in that context, what I think the original cultural science in the book that you're staring at was Web two cultural science. So this is the the, the, the argument I want to make. All right. Um, Let's, let's go back in time to about 2010, 2014, um, 20, let's go back 15 years. Um, the, the original cultural science research program that came out of the, a big research center that was um, at the time based in Brisbane at Queensland University of Technology, but sort of spread around the world. Um, you are the latest incarnation of that um, and have taken the, taken the flag forward on that. But, um, the original, the previous generation of that, the, the, the work we did 15 years ago on this, um, the, the, I think that the, the book that we wrote, I think, is the clearest sort of overview of what the idea was, but it was a, it was a whole research program of work. Um, the latest book on it is, is, has only just recently come out called Open Knowledge Institutions, focused on reinventing universities. But the broad theme throughout that body of work, um, published in a number of places, um, including the Journal of Cultural Science, is an attempt to understand um, to go from creative industries, you know, how do the creative industries drive innovation, to generalize that out to the question, how do we understand a multidisciplinary understanding of the growth of knowledge that doesn't get just hung up on the economist's view of this, um, but also doesn't just get hung up on the philosopher's view of it or the um, anthropologist or sociologist, but a, a genuine multidisciplinary approach to the growth of knowledge. And then to embed that into a science of um, of how we then can take and use that understanding of the growth of knowledge to improve, to, to, to better understand institutions and their dynamics, to better understand culture and society and its structure and dynamics, to then feed that into our understanding of economics and economic policy, um, and just, just everywhere we can think to push that. So not a niche concern, but a, an attempt to sort of rebuild a multidisciplinary research agenda that's focused around the question um, of the nature and origin of the growth of knowledge, one application of which is economic innovation. Um, another application of which is, is understanding sort of cultural studies and its dynamics. So um, as I sort of say, I've been involved with this for a long time, taken a number of different directions on it. That's the original cultural science research program. The point of this talk is to update that research program by pointing it in a 
what, what might seem a strange direction towards crypto. Um, but this is the case I want to make. All right, so um, maybe you've seen familiar with this. Um, maybe you're not. I'll presume not. Um, and just give you the sort of um, you know, many books, tens of books, um, hundreds of journal articles, millions of words. As far as I'm concerned, one idea, and it's this. Um, and it's the idea that it's a re-theorizing of what culture is and does. And away from the idea of culture as a product, as, a, as content, which is the creative industry's idea or the cultural industry's idea, and actually back into the, to the sort of sociology, anthropology, understanding of culture, but with a, with a bit of an evolutionary twist. So first key idea is that, the, what, that culture is a technology, a, a, an evolutionary technology made by humans, humans evolved culture. What is the you know, functional fitness purpose? You know, what, what is culture selected for? And the answer is culture is selected for its group making ability. Um, culture makes groups. It's an evolved technology that that creates um, high functioning groups. Um, now, lots of animals um, uh, live in groups. Um, humans are especially. The, the argument is humans are especially groupish. Um, of all of the animal and plants and species, we are the most groupish um, because of the evolutionary selection that has been supercharged by culture. So that's the first part of the story. And, and we say, so they, well, what are groups for? Um, the purpose of groups from this perspective is groups make knowledge. Groups make inside knowledge that is knowledge with, with respect to that group. Um, now, there's a whole sort of, um, sort of theoretical understanding of what's going on there with the storytelling in, the, in groups and we groups. And, but the basic idea is we don't think with our individual minds, we think with our group minds. Um, the, the, what language is, language is not an individual product of an individual human mind, it's a product of group interaction. Um, so that this idea of, of you know, language and culture and groups, again, um, nothing controversial about that. That's, that's just ev evolutionary sociology 101, right? Um, the, the novel point that we make, that we add to that is that this is a model not of knowledge of group making, but a model of innovation when these groups interact and, 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 and clash. And um, the, the broad sort of argument that we make here is that um, knowledge only works for your group. Um, a group doesn't use other groups' knowledge, you use your knowledge. Um, and, and, and what the growth of knowledge looks like is not a process of individual creativity in a human mind then diffusing through a population, the innovation diffusion model of evolutionary culture. Um, we have a different model. Again, um, all models are both, some are useful. Um, it's not against that model. It's just saying we also have another model of, of the nature of newness and novelty. And the core idea there is that for knowledge to grow, it's knowledge growing with respect to the knowledge in your group. Um, we use the word dean to describe a group with knowledge for reasons associated with, um, that's the, the way in which the deem is used in biology. It's also the way deem in demos is used in political science. Um, it's, the, it's the sort of technical term we're choosing to use to attach to, a, to describe a knowledge using in group. Um, and the idea is, is that the boundaries between groups have to change in order for knowledge to grow. I, I can only use knowledge that's in another group if the boundaries between my group and that group change. Now, that is a cultural process. It's a cultural process of cultural assimilation and storytelling and changing the difference between the we and the they and them and us and so on, in, in groups and out groups. But I mean, just to do some hand waving and say, that's the broad mechanism that we think of as a theory of innovation. And I'll just pause there to emphasize that that is not the model of innovation that works in evolutionary economics or economics in general, which is a basically um, a diffusion model where an innovation is a creative idea that has, happens in an individual mind and then spreads through communication and adoption to other minds, um, that's the process of market growth, it's the process of what you know, venture capital is designed to spread and so on. So that's a communication model of innovation. What we have is a group formation and conflict model of innovation. So um, that 
just again high level overview that's her idea of, of what of, of, of but that's how I understand cult. for me that's what cultural science is is, is, is that that core idea of, of group making groups make knowledge groups make innovation so with that in mind um, the connection through to, to blockchain is sort of evolutionary economics and creative industries and cultural science are all basic ideas around um, economic society, econ you know, economies, which are groups of people that cooperate using institutional technologies and economic growth and dynamics uh, change in those rules or technologies. Um, creative industries evolved out of cultural industries by just adding the innovation and evolutionary economics to that story. Um, it's cultural industries plus innovation economics equals creative industries. Cultural science was essentially going cultural studies plus innovation complexity. So all of that is of a piece. Um, the key insight that I'm just going to state now and then explain it in greater detail is the way to understand blockchain is blockchain is a computer science technology invented 15, 12 years ago. Um, but as far from the, from the perspective of an economist, what blockchain is, is an institutional technology. Um, it's a way, it's a new way using software for groups of people to come together in a peer-to-peer -to -peer way on the internet and coordinate to do things, whether it's exchanging tokens or um, you know, interacting through smart contracts and so on. Um, I'll, I'll dig into that. But the point is blockchain is an institutional technology for innovation, all right? Um, stepping back, there are two basic sorts of innovation in an economy, um, industrial innovation, or industrial technologies, which are the ones when people think of technologies, that's what they think of. It's the things you can patent. Um, new types of steel, um, new types of chemical molecules, um, new sorts of industrial processes. Um, most technologies are industrial technologies. However, there is also institutional technologies. Institutional technologies are more rare. Um, an example of an institutional technology is a parliament. Another example is democracy. Another example is the firm. Another example is markets. Another example is um, the, the, the use of, 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 um, of timetables to schedule productivity by everyone having a clock um, that help, tells the same time. So institutional technologies are technologies to coordinate cooperation between people to create value. They don't tend to change very often. The last big institutional technology we got was probably the joint stock company um, 200 years ago, right? Before that, you know, so institutional technologies are rare in terms of big changes in them, um, but they then organize all the in industrial technologies that sit on top of them. Um, the thing to note about blockchains when we wrote cultural sciences, they did not exist. Um, they only came into existence in 2009. Um, the thing about blockchains is blockchains are the latest institutional technology that humanity has discovered. Um, we are still very, very early in this process. This will be many decades to fully realize the implications of blockchain as an institutional technology. Um, but we're starting to see the early stages of it when blockchains are starting to reorganize markets and finance and other things that I'll talk you through. Um, but the, the punchline here is because blockchains are an institutional technology that coordinates groups of people coming together to organize and do stuff, make knowledge, that means blockchains are new ways of making and enabling deems. Um, what that means is that blockchains are doing the same thing that culture is doing. Um, they're organizing groups of people, that they're organizing humans into groups that create knowledge in, in, in using sort of institutions. So that's the, that's the sort of the big, bold idea here is, is that um, blockchains aren't a, a, a computer science technology, they're actually a cultural technology. And I want to sort of dig into the impl implications of what that then means. All right, so that's the, that's the overview of what my big idea is. I wanna go through um, blockchain crypto and then come back to it and, and revisit us and see what it is. Um, so again, apologies if, if this is all obvious and familiar to you. Um, I'm sort of just assuming not, um, but I'll, I'll move quickly in case it is. Um, the, the, what is blockchain crypto? For, if you ask a computer scientist or an economist, um, it's magic internet money, it's Bitcoin, it's tokens on the internet. Um, it's a software protocol. It literally is a software protocol and all of the variations and forks that have come from that. Um, it's the next generation of the internet. That's 
what web what we mean by web three what we mean by web three is it's distributed economic infrastructure it's digital distributed economic infrastructure um the way my the definition i like best is that it's a technology that tr creates trustless common knowledge it enables a group of people that don't know each other to coordinate on shared facts shared facts like who is that person who owns that coin um what is the state of that contract um and and to coordinate on that um i'm at a um the reason i'm in america right now i'm at the f global i mean the f denver conference and the definition i heard this morning was um a global non-violent tool for consensus right so that's that's blockchain the computer science economics definition um the cultural science definition that i want to propose that i think is interesting is that it's a new form of culture and the reason it's a new form of culture is because of its enabling capabilities and tools to make groups and that those groups are behaving in exactly the same way that culture does from the evolutionary web two perspective that cultural science was set out to go this is what culture is from a evolutionary perspective new way to make groups um again just just um this is new but it's not new um blockchain cryptocurrencies 10 12 years old um really they go back 60 70 years is the convergence of two tech trajectories internet and cryptography um one giving us sort of peer-to-peer -peer and, and private keys and public keys and so on um the other one giving us compute infrastructure and networks um this they come together as blockchain um, relatively recently. So again, this technology didn't come from nowhere. It's a, it's a convergent, it's, it's the convergence of two long running tech trajectories that, that have just come together. Um, the definition I like on this, um, it's a distributed append only ledger. It's an accounting technology. It's a way of keeping track of social, social facts, not, not physical individual facts, social facts, um, intersubjective facts facts that are true because because they are socially um because they are socially true in the sense that um you know net things like names and and property ident registries and so on are social facts of you know a bunch of crypto magic that enables these things to replicate it across a series of computer databases so again it's a it's an internet technology it's it's a peer to peer um technology but instead of a communications technology it's the way of trusting social facts um, one of the most obvious and important use cases of social facts is ownership and value um, and attestation of identity and attestation of claims um, why is that significant because that's what the economy is made of um, at the base of the economy of any economy is um, ledgers and registries that keep track of who owns what and who has agreed to what and what promises have been made to who when um, the other name for that is debt, is property, a contract, and so on. So at the base of all economies is this administrative layer of ledgers. Um, economists have never noticed that before because we've never needed to notice that because that technology hasn't moved for 2,000 years until 10 years ago it suddenly shifted. Um, so that's the, you know, this is an economic technology, but economists have never noticed it was there Um and until it suddenly shifted so what does it do digital scarcity right um the again with the web one web two web three thing i i, I really like the i mean i'm a big fan of this 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 way of describing <coughs> this way of describing blockchain um web one early internet um there was communication that was email right that was the early phase of that um that was that was the web as telephones connected together um, telephones connected together with computers right web one um, what could we do with that well turned out we could do global communication at at at, at, at near zero cost um, to the user web two um, web two was when we ruined it um, by the first generation of of building the economy on the internet by using companies um, you know and love them as google and facebook and amazon and and all of the all of the big monopoly um, infrastructure providers that provide that are that are corporate entities that provide the infrastructure to enable the economy to function on the internet they do the banking they do the identity management they do the the, the, the data pooling um, they do the contracting but they are basically shadow 
um, legal organizations. And the reason that they exist is that there is no native internet money, there is no native internet identity, there is no native internet contracts or internet law. Um, there is native communication on the internet, but there is no native economic tooling. There is no none of that base layer economic infrastructure that we need for a digitally native economy. What is Web3? The provision of all of that. Um, starting with money, that's cryptocurrency tokens, Bitcoin, first one. Um, then we just work through the gradual extension of all of that infrastructure out to just everything that is basic economic infrastructure for an economy to be built using, um, you know, using blockchain technology. So it's computer science, software, cryptography, mathematics, and accounting technology. But what it does is it builds economic infrastructure for a global digital economy. That's that's Web three. That's that's the well, that's the definition I I, I find very useful of, of what we mean by Web three. Um, where are we on that path? Right at the beginning, um, but moving much much faster than anyone ever thought. So um, again, Web three Internet of Value. It's a bit of a, a, a sort of 2017 meme, but it, but it is a useful one for understanding it. Um, social, so, but the, the sort of the insight here, and again, um, economists were just the last to understand this. Many of my economist colleagues still don't understand it um, because it was just, it was, it's hard to see things that don't change. And the idea that social consensus about truth as captured in registries that are administrative objects that sit in governments or corporations as an accounting technology of agreement about social facts. The idea that that's what the economy is made of um, and all of the industries and all of the technology and all of the firms and so on that sit on top of that, um, the measured economy, the bits that change, um, that's what we normally think of as the economy, but the economy actually goes all the way down to the registries and ledgers and fact, social facts, social consensus about facts. So that's what I mean by an institutional technology. And, and that's a, I think it's, it's an important, this was sort of a, an important idea for me in the sense that the, but the big mistake that innovation economists made was they assumed there was one type of technology, industrial technologies. There are two, industrial technologies and institutional technologies. Blockchain is an institutional technology and that is why it is significant. Um, it's a better ledger technology. Um, so that's the disrupt, that's the economic disruption that has just happened. It's also why it's confused everyone, why there's so much uncertainty, why there's so much um, yelling and shouting and excitement and, 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 and disruption. Um, we've written, I've written about this. I'm not going to talk about it here. That's not the purpose of this, but um, the book is Understanding the Blockchain Economy. Um, we put that out in 2019. There's a new edition coming out soon-ish. Um, um, we've, we've, we put it in the Journal of Institutional Economics to set that up, but just if you're interested in digging into that idea of institutional technologies, um, we, we've we explained that idea in some detail there. Um, the implication of that is the first thing that that does is it suggests that the, the sort of this transition from the industrial economy, um, which 200 is basically 200 years deep, um, I'm going to date it from 1790 uh, right through to more or less the 1970s when we sort of get the beginning of the first digital age, computers, the internet, and so on. And um, you know, this transition from industrial age to a digital age began around that point. But the first digital age was Web 1, Web 2. And that was just a um, computers and computation drives down the cost of a bunch of stuff, of a bunch of industrial stuff. Um, we can communicate faster and cheaper, but just essentially we substituted out um, the machine, the machines got better um, and computers ended up everywhere. And that's the first digital age. I think we're, we're at the end of that. I think that that 50 year first digital age um, sort of thing has come to an end. We're right at the beginning of the second digital age. I'm giving it that name because I can't think of a better name. Um, but the point is the, the transition is the second digital age begins with the first digital incursion into institutional technologies. That's blockchain, not the internet, blockchain. Um, blockchain was the first, I mean, so internet was first digital age in computers and, and the enormous power that, did, that that gave us. But I think this is, the, this is the disruptive transition we are in now. Um, it's always difficult to tell at the beginning of a new transition. You can only tell 
after the event. So in 10 years time, we'll know whether I'm right or not, but I'm calling it now. Um, we're in the beginning of a new era. We're coming at the end of an old one, second digital age. Probably should have a different name. Um, if you want a sense of what that, what that, what the architecture of that is, industrial economies look like this the, on the left. Um, all the economic infrastructure is base layer provided by government, um, or sometimes subcontracted out to corporations. But but it basically, and then the economy, the 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 industries, all of the sectors that the, the when we think of um, you know agriculture and manufacturing and all of this of Economy sits on top of that as a series of industry verticals that sit on a publicly provided economic infrastructure stack. Um, that's the property registries, that's identity documents, that's money, um, that's the court systems, that's the judicial system, that's all of the sort of institutional economic regulatory governance overhead that governments provide, and high quality governments provide good ones and low quality governments provide bad ones. And the basic modern explanation for why are some countries rich and some countries poor is that some countries, countries provide good versions of that economic infrastructure and other countries provide bad ones. And that's to a first approximation, the modern story of economic growth. Um, that's industrial economy, that era is over. That's the call. A digital economy looks different. A digital economy is, is more like a, a tech governance, a tech infrastructure stack, where all of that infrastructure is just layered and it is provided globally. It is provided by individual companies. It is decomposable and it is modular and decomposable. And this is what is being built out right now. We don't have industry verticals. Those are gone. Those are where the transition out of industry verticals um, into an era where basically it's just a government, a institutional stack from top to where that is digital from top to bottom. So this is again just a, a model for thinking about why a digital economy is architecturally, structurally different. We will need new ways of measuring it. We will need new ways of understanding why it's changing, but we are evolving from one architecture to another. Again, the last time we did that was the Middle Ages. This was the transition from the feudal economy to an industrial economy when we when we, we when the feudal economy, we didn't have those verticals. Um, then we just had a whole bunch of sort of just small island economies that did everything. Um, then we evolved into the, the industrial economy stack. We've got 200 years worth of that. Now we're evolving into this next one. All right, so that's the background of, of, of that. Um, the next point I wanna make is, is, that, is just to, to dig into the creative industry story here. Um, one of the first, the first sector to seriously pick up on blockchain tech um, beyond just beyond Bitcoin, um, beyond what was the creative industries. They were, they were there right at the very beginning. Um, and the reason creative, and this is, a, this is a slide actually I picked from a talk I did five years ago. Um, and I, 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 I dragged it out um, just to show, to, just to make the point that um, this stack, the blockchain will disrupt every sector of the economy and, and, and pivoted into this new stack model. But it was the creative industries that was the very first one that happened. Um, we think of DeFi as the first one, but it wasn't. It was the creative industries. Um, it just And the reason for that was the creative industries has the most broken infrastructure. Um, money, payments, digital identity, um, digital property rights and so on, working at a global scale, just in every possible way is, is, is just has been horribly broken right from the beginning. Um, so the, this, this notion of it's, it's difficult to be an artist unless you're super successful, especially at global scale, was because the identity, money, payments, organizational infrastructure um, was just expensive, has always been expensive and, and, and broken. So the creative industries, for, for, very good re for very good reasons, was the first sector to pick up and try to make sense of, of blockchain as a rebuilding the sector. Um, so I'll note that in passing. Um, the one that succeeded though was finance. Um, so this is DeFi, what is DeFi? Um, you've probably seen much of this before. Um, DeFi is basically just taking the finance industry, which is basically a series of relational contracts um, that need to be verified between counterparties in order to make promises that work into the future finance, whether it's debt contracting or equities, whatever. Um, 
Finance is a very, very old industry. It predates capitalism. Um, it's it's you know, a good solid 500 or 1,000 years old, depending on where you're counting from. Um, and it hasn't really changed much at all in that period in terms of the underlying architecture of it. It just, it just got bigger. Um, what DeFi is, is an attempt to tear that all down and rebuild it completely from scratch on a peer-to-peer -peer distributed decentralized business model based upon this new architecture of one layer does the consensus, one layer does the governance, one layer does the, the, the execution and protocol and so on. Um, this has happened incredibly quickly. Um, this is, you know, we're five years into DeFi, four years maybe. Um, we've got completely new primitives such as Uniswap, such as AMMs and so on, um, just whole new things. But the, the, the picture I just wanted to point to is that that ecosystem of infrastructure is rapidly building out, um, enabling people to come together and, and do exciting new things. So DeFi, first big sector that to actually, you know, creative industries went first, but it didn't really succeed. De finance went second and, and absolutely crushed it. Um, NFTs. Um, NFTs are basically property right, digital property rights on the internet for individual objects. Um, it solves the problem that the creative industries had always been trying to deal with, was how do I establish ownership and contracting over my unique object, my artwork, my song, my whatever it is. Um, that's always been a really easy, I mean, that's always been a, um, you know, there's a technical challenge in creating art, but there's just a horrible challenge in turning that into a business, uh, into a viable and especially global business model. Um, so what are NFTs? NFTs are sort of the first sort of just really new business model in that space. Uh, again, we are very, very early in the space. Um, all I want to do is just point to the idea that there's been a lot of very rapid development in moving through that. Um, the point I want to note, though, as we pass through NFTs, is that the way NFTs are evolving in creative industries is not as just straight up um, digital versions of art um, and collectibles. That's 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 on the surface. Um, the most in, the more interesting part of them are things like CryptoPunks and 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 um, board at yacht clubs and so on, where we're starting to see them as things that are building communities. Um, the crypt, board ape yacht club is a community um, of people that own that and start to figure out what to do. So we're starting to see these sort of NFTs evolving into cultural mechanisms for making groups, deems, in groups. Um, there are people that own them and there are people that don't. There are people in the community and the people that don't. And basically these NFTs are ways to access and control and, and modulate those communities. So I just want to point that you know, it's digital art, it's, it's, a, it's a tokenized representation of, of, of an artwork, but they're evolving into community management structures. So I'll just put that there. Um, and I think that's, so just in passing, that's, that's a sort of interesting point to note, I think about how NFTs illustrate the argument I'm making here, that what we're evolving, what, we, what I think we're seeing here is blockchain evolving into a new type of culture, not in the sense of um, the, the culture of blockchain, but rather a new type of make a new a, tech, a new institutional technology for making and managing and coordinating and organizing groups of people. Um, and groups in the inclusive sense of us, as opposed to them, we versus they. So, I mean, that's and NFTs illustrate that really nicely. Um, they're a new type of property rights, but fundamentally they're starting to, to become a, a new mechanism to, um, to coordinate groups. You see this with, with meme, meme culture, like it's just, they, this, this entire space is coordinated with memes. Um, what are memes? Memes are basically insider signifiers that a group understands what it means and the out group doesn't know what it means and it, therefore it works as a, as a, as a semiotic object. All right, DAOs. Um, so what is blockchain? Blockchain is economic infrastructure. Um, the, what was the first thing we saw was cryptocurrencies and tokens, then DeFi, then NFTs. The, the latest one, the, the, the sort of 2021, 2022 thing, we're in the year of the DAO. Um, what are DAOs? DAOs are organizations made of smart contracts. Um, and this is the one that is just most explicitly demic. And, and um, I think this is also the most disruptive one, that part of the story. So what a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. The idea for this was right there in the beginning of the 
um, Ethereum white paper, Vitalik mentioned, Vitalik Buterin, um, mentioned DAOs as one of the potential use cases of smart contracts back in 2013 when that was first written. Um, they haven't really taken form yet until relatively recently. Um, but what a DAO is, is basically a way to, to um, a new technology to compete with the company, the firm, the organization, a digital version of that using smart contracts. So it's a group of people, um, a way to coordinate a group of people using smart contract rules. The first big use case for DAOs is um, decentralizing protocols. So a lot of the protocols that have been pushed out in DeFi in particular, um, the way in which they're managed is they're pushed out and managed by a DAO. So they, it's not, um, and an example, one, one that I'm working with, for instance, is Tracer DAO. Tracer is a DeFi protocol and it makes um, perpetual, um, perhaps, um, which are a type of derivative, um, but it is governed by a DAO. Um, it is not governed by the Tracer Corporation, it is governed by the Tracer DAO, which is a distributed autonomous organization that controls um, the evolution of the underlying protocol. So the industry, the, 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 fin the, the finance protocol is being governed by a decentralized um, organization DAO. So we're starting to see this, this sort of full stack of, uh, at work there. Um, an example of DAOs, so DAO protocols, um, one that I think is particularly interesting is investment DAOs, an obvious use case. A group of people come together and want to buy something and hold it collectively. Um, if they want to come together and buy an NFT, which is a digital tokenized property right object, um, that group of people can come together. They can organize the bidding for it. They can organize the um, ownership, the collective ownership of it and, and use of that thing. So um, investment funds are an obvious use case of DAOs. So are pension funds. So are just anything that needs to hold assets collectively, um, which is also what a company does, right? So, um, but the thing is they are fast. We can organize them quickly. We can organize them at global scale um, and we can organize them very, very cheaply um, to you know, come together within the space of a few hours, hundreds of people around the world can come together and basically do a thing that, that previously only corporations could do that would take months to organize and involve many thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to organize. So again, low cost way of people coming together to do unspecified things. Um, lots of experimental and in, in some cases, disastrous use cases early of this, but we are very early in this process. Um, the other thing I'll point out here is that DAO tooling, the technologies and tools to do this is also really evolving rapidly. Um, just in the space of the last year, we've seen this explosion of DAO tools around treasury management and operations and governance and voting and so on. Um, things that are, you know, that have you know, ideas from democracy, ideas from corporations all put together, turned into software, pushed onto the internet. Again, what this looks like is that stack. I was talking about um, this modular composable functional stack of tools for organizing people entirely composed of blockchain technology. Um, why is this disruptive? Because at some point in the future, you'll probably work for one of these. Um, I already do, um, and for several of them, um, as well as my other job. So again, just, just I'm trying to point out that's where we're up to right now, just in passing, what I want you to note about every example I just gave was this, um, this magic money on the internet is, is fundamental. I mean, that's one view of it, but I think the far more interesting view of it is institutional technologies for coordinating groups of people to do stuff, um, usually innovative novel stuff. What does that remind us of? The basic definition of um, the cultural science conception of a deem. So let me go back to where I started and, and, and make the argument again. Um, the fundamental view of cultural science in the, in the early, in the sort of web two version of it, the, the Hartley Potts version of it, is culture makes groups, groups make knowledge. Um, the, the, when groups with knowledge um, crash into each other, it makes innovation. So innovation and newness, cultural newness comes from, from that process. What just happened on our watch in the past 12 years, um, for the first time in about a hundred years, really for the sixth time in only a thousand years, is we got a powerful new global group making technology. It just arrived on the scene. Um, it arrived on the scene um, 
just in time for us to um, yeah so 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 I think that's worth updating cultural science or the original conception of cultural science circa the 20 2007 slash 2014 version of it to update it to this new conception of that so that's what that's the research direction I want to point in and the reason I want to point in that. Um, so again, I don't know whether whether this is worth pursuing, but it seems interesting to me. Um, I'm going to pursue this. But the basic argument here is um, blockchains are institutional technologies. Institutional technologies are uh, relatively rare technologies that don't change very often, but when they do change, societies and economies and cultures transform. Um, the, that notion of thinking of blockchains as institutional technologies means that they are also a way of making deems, and that was the insight. That that was the insight that I really only just came to in the past few days. Um, and what that then means is that we can think of blockchains as not just institutional technologies for lowering the costs of economic coordination. Right? They're not just the next generation of the internet in the sense that. And then economies got even better and even faster and even cheaper and just carried on down that trajectory that they were on. What I'm predicting is that that trajectory is about to wildly change. And the reason it's going to change is because of cultural science reasons. Um, we've just got a powerful new technology for making knowledge and innovation. That's the new idea. Um, we know blockchains are a new technology for lowering the cost of economic transactions and finance gets better and faster and cheaper and so on. The industries get better, faster, cheaper. But if cultural science is correct, what we also get is a huge spur and kick um, and disruption of innovation. And if that happens, um, that, that's the disruptive effect of blockchain. So um, this is setting it out as a, as a series of, of, of what I think the, the sequence of mechanisms are. Um, the, you know, in homage to John Hartley, they will call this the four therefores. Um, innovation, so cultural science is the idea that, that culture is a forcing function on innovation, um, not just venture capital and creativity, but culture. Um, blockchain just dramatically lowered the cost or increased the scale of making groups. Um, what's an example of that? DAOs. Um, we're about to see just an explosion in the world of DAOs. What does that look like? Um, for the past 300 years, we've gone from no corporations and no nation states up to 192 nation states and about 10 million corporations. My prediction is that in the next decade or two, those numbers are gonna double again because of DAOs. We're just gonna see an explosion of them because they're so cheap and fast and easy to make. What is a DAO? A group of people come together to create knowledge and do things, um, but the cost of doing that, the pop-up of the, the, the temporality of that has just dramatically fallen. So it's much, much cheaper to make groups because of this technology. Um, what does that mean? If we've got a whole lot more groups, we've got a whole lot more groups crashing into each other. We're going to experience a lot more demic conflict. Um, what is that going to look like? Um, it's going to, a, if you think the culture wars are bad now, wait till you see what's coming. Um, that's, we're going to get, that's that process of just of group conflict um, is going to accelerate, but so too will innovation because that, that process is, is according to, I mean, this is, cultural science, the, the basic thesis of cultural science is that that process, while massively disruptive and requiring group boundaries to be, re, boundaries to be redrawn, is the nature of how innovation moves. Um, what does that look like? A rapid acceleration of economic and social evolution. Um, that's the prediction that comes back into my field. Um, why is this interesting for, eco economic, for economists? Is that the, the relatively smooth peri period of economic growth that we've seen over the past 200, 250 years. Um, the thing that, that took us from the, you know, the medieval period through to the modern economy, um, that smooth growth is about to accelerate and it's gonna accelerate in a very disruptive way. So what does that look like to conclude? Um, that's why I think crypto is the obvious, net, web, why Web3, um, broadly understood, is the obvious next research program for cultural science. Again, 
of all the people in the world I can talk to, you are the one group that probably understands that already in your bones. Um, but this is the, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's um, at least I've now understood that. Um, but what that then means is that the, the sort of cultural studies approach to blockchain crypto, the sort of problematizing NFTs, the what about the energy use sort of things, while interesting, I think is fundamentally missing the point. I think there's just a much bigger issue that's right in front of us, which is this idea of understanding blockchain and crypto as a new form of institutional technology for making groups that we can understand through this multidisciplinary lens of cultural science. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, if we want to talk about a completely separate topic, the other thing that I've been working on is data DAOs, um, but that's another use case for DAOs, but again, unrelated. I just want to mention that in closing, but I will stop there and open this up for discussion. Thank you very much. This was a very, 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 very comprehensive overview and it's great. Thank you very much also for sort of like uh, making this uh, um, amenable, not only for uh, the experts, but also for the beginners, uh, because we're having a broad spectrum of people. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So I see there is applause in the audience. Um, let's maybe start off the discussion with um, what you said at the very end. Um, if you think culture wars are bad now, wait for what is coming. Uh, but we will see lots of innovation. Yes. So a couple of days ago, the World Economic Forum uh, posted this picture where they had uh, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3. A Web 1 looked like sort of uh, a tree. A web 2 looked like a network. And um, Web 3 looked like a regular thing with uh, uh, boxes. <laughs> Uh, and the boxes were obviously um, the blockchain. And the network science community um, sort of very snarkily um, forwarded a tweet which said, uh, oh my God, the network illiteracy of the World Economic Forum is just unbearable. And so the key question is, where's, where's the network? So, so we're going back to a layered model and there's hierarchy and um, so, so the key thing is you, you, you explain something about uh, pillars that are vertical and now we have horizontal layers, but how about the network? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, my sense of what this looks like is just massive network overlays. So instead of these sort of industry verticals and countries and the sort of, sort of corporate nation state organization of things, and then, you know, and then along comes the internet and sort of threads that all together as a communication network. What I think we're evolving into, um, this is the, what we're right at the beginning of, of this, is this, this type of, of massive modular organizational networks. And, and what that specifically looks like, I mean, a very, I mean that's an abstract thought, but the very, the very concrete meaning of this is at the moment, I live in one country, I work for one company, I have one job um, at the university in Australia. Um, that is not the future. What, what, what the future of this looks like is I, I am, I am connected into many, many DAOs, possibly hundreds of them. Um, that's the network. This, this. I, 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 mean, I might do this here. I might do that there. Um, and, and these things. And the, each of these DAOs doesn't exist in a country. They, they're, they themselves exist as a organizational network around the world. And so basically, the the network becomes the sort of economic infrastructure. At the moment, we've been thinking of network as communication networks that are gradually becoming complex. What I think we're evolving into is kind of institutional infrastructure networks. Um, again, that's, that's an abstract thought, but the, what, what's, what that specifically looks like to me is a series of smart contracts that I'm connected to um, into a series of DAOs that I'm working with. Um, each of those DAOs is a, is a, is, 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 is a network of, of smart contracts, other things. And I think, you know, so well, what is that? That's, that's that full network stack. So I had that, that stack image be, um, in one of the slides where you know, it's a consensus layer, governance layer, blah, blah, blah. Those are networks. Every single one of those is a network. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're, they're sort of threaded together. So um, 
I think that's that sort of evolution from communication network or messaging network or network of signals to network of contracts or network of agreements or network of sort of negotiated social truths. Um, we don't really even have a word for that. We're going to use, you know, the, the idea that we use the word network for the same things doesn't feel right. But again, that's where we are now. Um, we're probably missing a word for, for what that is. But I, but, but I think it's here already. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience. Uh, Mark Hunnett. Uh, your mic is off. Yeah, now? Yes, yes. sorry. Now it works. Uh, always the same thing, the, the adapter that I have. Um, okay, like I'm, I'm very interested in talk. Uh, I, I am engaged a little bit on, on the topic, uh, especially as an as a artist um, in the NFT world a little bit. I mean, Tezos, uh, I, don't, I don't do any Ethereum for ecological reasons. And, and I'm collecting some, some NFTs with the money I do with my own uh, thing. But what you were describing at the end, uh, just like recent reason uh, of this, like managing hundreds of DAOs and, and, and these kind of things, for me seems like a like a mess, which actually is like I see now, uh, like I'm, I'm trying to make the tax declaration and I have to go to all these um, platforms and, and gather all the information. In, in, in most of them, they don't have, they still never had this request. I, I, I'm, I'm being like asking them, can you export me the, the um, outs and ins to, to I can I can do something uh, instead of spending two or three weeks on on myself like manually gathering the information um, means I'm, I'm not too sure if this will work but I understand many of the things that you say like about trust about um, um, yeah about I'm not sure about some things you mentioned like for example this that because they create if industry is broken, this thing that you were saying. I mean, I'm I, 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 before I was doing my PhD, I was like a professional. I'm I'm mean, still, but I mean, a professional artist living only from uh, commissions and and actually very opposite to many artists. Like my, my market has been global always. Uh, like not not like in one country. Uh, I always say that an artist that works only for one city is a corruption. Means it actually has some kind of. Um, a group of people that just put him in all the exhibitions. But if you actually have like a global, uh, it's more like um, that you are validated. And, and it's like that. I mean, one thing that I like it in the in the NFT is that, for example, in art, and that's one comment, is that it had broadened the audience. And I think that's a, a very interesting thing that I have followed, um, that um, digital art was definitely undermined. Uh, it's like the more produced art nowadays. Um, everyone is using digital tools. Even sometimes it, it gets in an analog way, like printed or, 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 or 3D printed or CNC it in marble. I have uh, artists that I know that they do marble sculptures. They come from digital um, because that's how no one is like um, like uh, hitting the stone. You just use a CNC and, 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 cut, and, and it's just like... Uh, rooted uh, like a marble means definitely like digital has it, it, it is like we are living in a digital era um but yeah i mean some things i mean i am not like a hundred percent and um in on the on on the this will disrupt so much but uh, definitely it, it will change all the things that were not working like um like I don't know. In Estonia, for example, the notary system is really advanced. Um, in Spain, where I'm from, uh, it, it looks like from the Middle Age. Um, means definitely um, it will help to advance this kind of like registered systems that in some places is got stuck. And, 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 and you can see also even from the salaries. Uh, in, in Spain, like a, a notary property uh, has like one of the, it, it's like, the, the salary is two times the president of Spain. It's like the, the average salary of another property is a hundred and something thousand, which <laughs> like is two times the salary of, of the president of Spain, which is funny because one of our president of Spain, Rajoy used to be another property and now we come back because the salary is, is bigger. 
um, means in Estonia it's actually lower uh, because the, the technology had go and it's not so important uh, as so, but it works really, really well. Um, yeah, I think that, that is my, my, my yeah. comment. Yeah, it will come some, some concrete question, but it was the comment. Oh, interesting. I, I was, I'll just make one sort of point about that. I mean, I think um, we're, we're at a stage now where we just, we're just we living in two institutional worlds. We're living in the old institutional world with the old tax system and so on and so on, and simultaneously the, th the digital NFT one. And that is the worst possible way to be. So, I mean, I think it, things will get better with, in the sense that um, you know, we'll get better at the administrative taxation of, of these, these sorts of objects. But um, yeah, at the moment, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's we're, we're, we're going through a, trend, a transition period. And these sort of transition periods are always are always a lot rougher than um, than, than the mature the mature ecosystems. Mila. Yeah, thank you. Super interesting. I'm I'm really thrilled about your talk. Um, I'm myself cultural historian, and I'm looking at circulation of knowledge and how different groups of people have been creating knowledge using different kinds of like technologies over you know 150 years and so on and I I could not agree more that uh, also understanding the new forms of culture of today is is highly interesting and it's also very very important um, one of the things that I wanted to ask um, is that of course um, we know that always in, in all kinds of like institutional technologies and cultural systems, they contain some kinds of like um, inequalities as well and structures that, you know, um, promote others than uh, more than, than some other people and so on. So I'm, I'm curious, what kinds of like um, structures of inequality do you see in this emerging new culture? And how could we, is there a way that we could kind of like make it more equal look it's 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 the right question um i'm seeing two forces going in opposite directions um both interesting so the first one the obvious one um some people are getting very rich um some people are getting very rich for completely random reasons like it's not as a deservedness for for, for you know moral superiority or whatever inside they just got lucky um so that that kind of um random redistribution that is that is pushing huge amounts of money around um not good for inequality right that's 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 distorting it um the other force the other force going in the opposite direction the, the one that i think is that, i mean that one's obvious and it's it's clearly a problem um the tax system should fix that um if you've got a progressive tax system this should eventually just come right so uh, so I'm, even though it's real i'm actually not worried about that one at all um the, the one that I think is more interesting is um, the barriers to access and entry into the space. What I, what I love about this space so much, the reason that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm morally attracted to this space is that it is disruptive of a lot of old world power, um, a, lot of, a lot of privilege, um, a lot of privilege that was built up around inside access to institutions. Um, particularly in finance, but 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 more generally, and what this looks like to me is um, um, so the, the conference I'm at right now, East Denver. Um, I'm by far the oldest person there. Um, it's it's a it's it's a whole bunch of just young people um, that don't strike me as especially privileged or, or or whatever. It's it's just just enthusiastic and willing to try. Um, from all around the world that are coming in. So I think there's a moment right now. Um, I don't know how long this moment is going to last for, whether it'll sustain, but I've never seen greater access to a very, very powerful technology by just anyone who wants it. And the people that are picking, picking that up, um, I mean, what is striking about crypto is just how global it is. Um, it, is, it, is, it is not concentrating in, in the traditional places of power and wealth and privilege. It is just coming from everywhere because all you need is a mobile phone and access to the internet um, to, to sort of begin. So I like that aspect of it right now. Um, I don't know how the, the barrier that I am worried about is, is digital literacy um, because that's the one that's, if you're on the right side of digital literacy, you're fine. If you're on the wrong side of that, you are shut out of this forever. Um, and 
I mean, what's interesting about that is the demographic profile of that. That doesn't skew rich country, poor country. It basically skews old, young. Um, and I, so, so there's, I think there's some really interesting social dynamics and demographic dynamics at play here. Um, on the whole, even though there's there's a lot of new inequalities being created, I think the new, the the um, the opportunities that people were otherwise on the outside um, to come in, um, um, like we're doing a lot of work in in Vietnam and Guatemala at the moment, just just looking at just how um, how communities that don't normally have a lot of access to economic infrastructure are, are able to just completely bypass broken governments and just create their own infrastructure themselves, um, or broken banking systems and create it. So um, again, this is it's a it's a research question. I'm I'm, I'm not prejudging this. Um, could be wildly wrong about this, but my my broad sense is that there's there's a moment here where this this does actually seem to be pushing in the direct in, in that direction, and it's pushing in that direction. I mean, I'll, I'll I'll conclude by saying it's pushing in that direction without the need for regulation and political action to do so. It's just it's just in the technology. Um, I'm actually worried about a lot of regulation closing that loop down, particularly around um, a lot of new finance and privacy laws that the bank that a lot of the global banking system wants, um, because that's that's that works well for them. I'm actually shutting that down. So um, this, I think this is a very interesting situation where just straight up tech innovation um, on some margins is actually resolving toward um, as a force for um, overcoming inequality and in access to you know, value creating wealth making technologies. Um, again, I, I hope I hope you know it's too early to tell completely. I, I, you know, we we need more research, but but I'm actually broadly optimistic about this. Um, okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it was uh, very interesting and thought is inspiring indeed. And uh, well, some ideas were definitely new for me, and I should should sort of reflect on that, but. Basically, what I want to do is to sort of work as a devil's advocate and try to try to poke holes in what you are saying, uh, because you are sort of assuming for granted that this uh, new blockchain technology is uh, by default better than what exists now. That, and as far as I understand, you 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 argue that it is better in terms of the trans transactional costs are smaller and in terms of it is uh, easier to construct groups. Although at least for a couple of examples, which I think you mentioned, uh, uh, I don't actually f sort of thinking of Personally, of myself, I don't see exactly what the advantage is. For example, you speak about finance. I do have this fancy invention called credit card. I go to the shop. I use my credit card uh, anywhere in the world, essentially. It works for, for a fraction of a second. It costs me negative money. That my my bank actually gives me sort of cash back, which is which call, which gives me more than uh, than than the costs uh, the, the the cost I, I, I'm paying uh, using blockchain for any sort of financial transaction for ages will be uh, incalculably uh, more expensive and cumbersome. Uh, number two, you mention. Uh, formation of groups and in particular formation of groups in work. Uh, for example, I, I think it is typical for more or less uh, any academic for, for the, at, the, at the moment I have like a four to 10 projects from with uh, of different structure with uh, people working at seven or eight different countries in the world. And the limiting factor is definitely not 
uh, the ability to form groups with people. The limiting factor is the, the, the amount of time and effort you need to switch from one project to another. And I definitely don't want to have 100. I probably want to have less than more than I have my, uh, at the moment. So can you please comment on this? Yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're all valid points. Um, I want to push back on your credit card example. Um, just Europeans in general, you've got a fantastic financial system there. It's one of the best and oldest in the world. Um, of all of the people in the world, you probably don't need blockchain technology for payments. Um, however, however. Uh, I'm um, sorry, I'm sorry, I will interrupt because because the, the people, I, I never been there, but the people say that the best, the best mobile uh, and earliest developed mobile uh, banking technologies in Kenya and places like that. Yeah, okay, but that's, that's, that's an example on my that that's an example that points to, that's all peer to peer um, payments technology that's that's in this direction um you're not getting it for free you're 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 paying with data um the credit card companies sell your data that that's that's the reason that you get it at, at the negative rates um so and you don't get it it doesn't work in a second um it, the your credit card settles in about 3 to 4 weeks um the the, the transaction was approved in one second, but the transaction is not completed um, until all the chargebacks and so on are done. Um, consumers love credit cards, merchants hate them. Um, it's, it's not a symmetrical relationship. Um, so, so, so again, I'm, I'm just sort of saying that, you know, that's, that, there's, that technology still has room for improvement, um, even though it feels very smooth from the consumer side. Um, the, the, the other, I mean, but, but again, I, I take your broad point that's that, um, you know, but again, that technology has been refined for modern banking systems are two or 300 years old. We're two or 300 years into improving that technology. We're only five years into this one. So it will get better at the moment. Um, uh, yeah. the, the other one, um, the, the sort of, you know, no one wants a hundred jobs. That sounds horrible. I, I agree. Um, but the, the reason it's horrible is, as you say, the switching costs and so on, that I have to sort of figure out how to do that, whatever. Um, the, the huge advantage, and again, we're just at the beginning of this, of this period, is the possibility just to automate a lot of the administrative costs that make that horrible. Um, so, I mean, I, it's not the case that I want 100 jobs. What I want to be able to do is to work all the time on just stuff I'm passionate about and not have any downtime or annoying stuff where I'm doing stuff I don't want to do. Um, so the, the conception of 100 jobs isn't 100 administrative organizations that I have to figure out how to interact with. That's software. The conception of 100 jobs is just for every moment of the day, I'm doing the thing that I'm best at, wherever that is. Um, and, and sort of magic automation takes that place in the background. Now, we are not there yet. We are a long way from that. But that's the conception of the sense in which that world could be better. Um, but I, 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 you know, I'll freely admit that that, that may be wildly... The, pro the problem is not the, the administrative cost. The problem is that uh, one guy wants to solve one problem, another guy wants to solve another problem. I can be useful both here and there, but, but I need to switch my mind, uh, which, yeah. which, which is not working on black blockchain. It, 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 yeah. it, uh, yeah. I need to, to throw something out of my mind and something in get and sort of uh, access something different that that, that 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 is not solved by by yeah. by, the, by the relaxing of administration costs. Yeah, and that's a fair point. Yep. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, indeed. So well. Uh, thanks to Mike. Now I actually have a second question, so maybe I'll connect with. I start with that. <laughs> it's going next better. So, so uh, the after, after reading your your cultural science ideas, so that it, it's focused on the group level, and that's the main focus. So maybe I will ask in in that sense that so. Mm, so how about this this role of individuals in there, like especially in the sense that uh, so, sort of in this uh, for me it relates to this non non neo Darwinian idea ideas of uh, evolution like 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 you do it connects like this complexity theory um, mm. and uh, sort of cultural evolutionary changes but but also in like even in biology it's more acknowledged that uh, sort of the agent individual agent it can have like um, lots of sort of unpredictable uh, uh, power or effect in the culture like uh, the, during their own lifetime like just like how the 
um, uh, individual being complex system in itself, basically. So, so how it, for example, how he relates to environment, he creates some sort of unpredictable changes. And like even in, in that, that sense, like, uh, so based on some unpredictabilities on this individual level, like uh, maybe the, the choices of the people who would transfer to this uh, new blockchain technology, would it be more, more un unpredictable actually? I don't know. It's it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think. I mean, just just to, just to make clear that the this this isn't an alternative theory. This is a complementary theory to try and understand the the group interaction or the role of group interactions. Um, you know, we already have very well developed understandings and, and and theoretical frameworks for you know creativity and innovation coming from individual agency. It was just try to try and get a sense of. Of, of what the limits of that were, like how far could we explain without invoking that hypothesis? Um, so I, again, I, I um, you know, and again, an economist, this is all we do is, is, is reason up from individual choice outwards. Um, so that, I mean, for, for me, this was, for me as an economist, this, this approach to trying to sort of reason from a cultural group perspective was a, was a substantial sort of analytic methodological novelty for me to try and sort of work through through that so um yeah so i mean that was that was sort of why i was introducing that as a um as a as a, as a, as a concept but i mean but to your to your broader point um i i mean i guess that's kind of what the research program i'm trying to think through is is trying to, trying to figure out what that question is like how do we understand the role then of of individual agency in that in that new context um i mean i, I think Rather than trying to answer that, I think that is the research question: is to try and answer, is to try and figure that out. Yeah, thanks, thank you. Uh, but uh, there's no other hands up. Then I'll also, also ask the, the other question. But um, so, so basically, in the sense of let's comparing this, uh, this sort of themes, let's say with sort of social media groups, let's say. Uh, so, so it, it is the change is something more fundamental than, than we're just dealing with some social media groups or something that we already yeah. have, as, as you said. But it's uh, but basically what, what is the driving like uh, motivation uh, for uh, these teams? Uh, like, like what's the motivation between the models in teams? Why do you think that they will be more uh, uh, so, uh, sort of, uh, well, why the culture war will, will get bigger? Uh, in these groups, and so is it, is it like is it some sort of money-driven competition, uh, no. or, or is it is it yeah. sorry, sorry, but it's also that this uh, or, or the existing social media groups they get more ingrained because they these groups will develop, uh, but they will also include financial and other layers, not only social layers. Yeah, I I mean I I think it actually goes the other way, and and again. Um, you know, it, it may be too early to tell yet, but I mean, my sense of this is that the big lesson that social media taught us was the, it's, it's Web2, right? So what did Web2 teach us? One, data is incredibly valuable as an economic resource that you can capture by having a large enough harvesting net. For that, you need large corporations. They become enormously profitable. So from the business side, the um, large amounts of data capture equals uh, equals um, huge huge business opportunities and and financial motivations to build those those big data harvesting networks um, was one big lesson but the other lesson on the consumer user side was um, that most people get enormous value from their own social networks that it's, it's basically um, when given the choice between connecting to um, sort of you know random um, talking news head or thing or just interacting with 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 um, self-selected groups of your peers you chose self-selected groups of your peers and every business model that sought to exploit that sought to develop that succeeded um, so I think that now the the monetization strategy there was data this wasn't a this wasn't people forming groups in order to make money this was people forming groups because they could and there was a data capture that made money behind the scenes of that. I mean, that was the big thing that we learned in, in Web3. That was the huge disruption that happened. What I think is about to happen is that, is that people are getting sick of being data harvested um, for money. And a lot of the motivation that's behind the, you know, just the, the energy that I see 
people building new blockchain tech is it's to escape that world not to move more towards it or to try and find new ways of, of making money in that space it's it's actually a we want to build our own economic infrastructure that doesn't have that that sort of harvesting mercenary quality quality to it and again i i, I don't know whether that's just just an early phase that, that, that might be romantic and naive and eventually harsh reality will intrude. Um, but, I, but, but I think that's, I mean, that's what I see driving the, you know, who, who is building this technology, the, you know, the people that are coding this up and building that, that blockchain economic infrastructure that is competing with the old economic infrastructure. They're not, you know, they may be getting rich, but that is not a, it's not setting out to make money sort of thing. That's a, setting out to build the tools that they want to do the things that they want. Um, it's, it's the open source software um, and open hardware. It's the, you know, it's the open innovation um, cultural model. And the tools for doing that have just been massively democratized. Again, that makes me optimistic um, that, we're in, you know, that, that we're heading away from a highly monetized, highly financialized world um, into something that is actually far more um, commons-based infrastructure. Nice. This is a Thank great you. sig. I, I, I also uh, ask a question in between um, as there is uh, same faces showing up. Um, so you say people are sick of being data harvested. So can we ask a question who's sick of being data harvested? So we can probably agree that um, um, yeah, to go to a crypto conference, um, to hang out at South by Southwest in the Web3 sort of crowd. Um, yeah, there's young people, but uh, it's outrageous privilege to show up there because it costs a lot of money. Even being, being there is uh, not easy. So we're, we're not talking about Kenya. Yeah. Um, people who are privileged enough uh, to, uh, from time to time, travel to Switzerland know that as you exit the airplane on the very billboard, which is the first billboard you see as you exit uh, the international sort of uh, area, um, you're not encouraged to show up a particular bank to hide your money in either mm. Switzerland or Singapore. The same bank now advertises, uh, giving you hints how to sort of like put your money into crypto <laughs> where you can't be data harvested and nobody knows where your money goes. So that is, that is like frame number one. So, so there is obviously an interest of people who want to hide particular financial transactions. Number two, there is another thing, which is uh, the whole notion of that this is all new. Uh, so there's obviously new technology. There's uh, stuff that uh, you know, there's undeniable. The NFT art explosion that happened in March is uh, out of this world in terms of like how much is produced and how many people engage. But at the same time, um, when we are looking deeply, I'm an art historian, okay, so where, where does the ledger come from? It's a technology that was sort of like um, developed between Euphrat and Tigris. Um, there was a code used, which is uh, the, the language that can only be written by scribes. So you need to actually, so that's a privilege. Um, it's also, you know, there's not much difference to crypto. Um, you show up, you say, I lend you a sheep. Uh, um, we testify in front of the scribe and there's a third person who testifies in addition. And that's basically what you put in a table. I mean, they literally wrote tables yeah. of that. And then all this ends up in a thing called the Library of Nineveh at the end, which is a good testament of culture, the Gilgamesh epos, we wouldn't have it, and all that stuff, which was built by a scribe, the first one that actually assumed power out of these priests the hierarchy, the, the, the government of the priests, Asur Bani polarizes and becomes sort of like the first god empire emperor. And obviously he was also one of the most brutal people on the planet in terms of how he sort of like, um, you know, sort of like exerted his power. So we're describing a system where you say, we go from a parallel system, we go from democracy to a layered system that is hierarchical, where we use code to write in stuff, which utterly looks like something that can be misused. And um, then there is the very same tropes that are used in other, as Benedict Anderson calls it, imagined communities, mm. namely that this is something only the in crowd understands and the others don't. 
right? You said, for example, your fellow economists don't understand. That is a classic kind of thing. And so I'm, I'm also playing devil's advocate here. Um, I'm not meaning it that way. And then there's this thing, where do the transitions come from? Tim O'Reilly, who coined the word two point, Web 2.0, was very critical about Web 3 recently, where he said, like, you know, I don't see it. I don't see the big difference, like after the dot-com bubble, where there was, there was a bunch of companies that were left, and they looked very, very different to the companies that, looked, uh, that we had before the dot-com bubble. And we don't see the transition right now. It's all gradual. Uh, mm -hmm. Same is true with 1790. What is this? Is it the first US census? Is it one year after the French Revolution? Why is this 20 years after the uh, Treaty of Paris, which would be Great Britain and uh, America's much more important date? Or what is it? And so I think these kind of things are, are super important because otherwise we end up in a situation where we declare a new era that is not really new. Um, and that means that in this new era, we make the very same mistakes because we don't read the old books in the very same way that modern history scholars start in 1790 and don't read any book that deals with the 1600s. So, so how do we deal with, with this sort of yeah. notion that this may not be one new thing, but something that stretches yeah. out and is basically the same story? Yeah, so I, I actually agree with a lot of that. Um, I think the the thing I would caution, the thing that, that I'm focused on here is I don't think we'll recognize it in the sense of these are the big new crypto companies, for instance, or the big new things that, that, that we can see. Um, I think that precisely what is happening, and again, um, the, the reason I sort of threw up those sort of ecosystem pictures of DeFi and, and, and DAOs is that what this looks like is an explosion of lots of small things, lots of small tools. Um, and it's hard to sort of get excited about, you know, now there's 10,000 new little apps that you can do a thing with. Um, that just looks like a mess. But I think that is the transformation. Um, and what that is gradually just, because what that, what that sort of 10,000 new little apps that you can modularize and assemble and, 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 and that are composable, what that looks like is amazing power on the user side or the builder side just to assemble and use those at will to make whatever you want. And I mean, that's, to me, that looks like a huge powering up of user innovation or consumer innovation. And that's the bit I'm excited about. But what just got weakened there was corporate innovation. And I'm, you know, I, I I don't think this will look like a battle of two Goliaths and then a new Goliath comes in and that's Web3. I think mm -hmm. what this looks like is just a slaying of old dragons and, and that's it. Um, we, we just, um, so, but, so, you're, so you're anticipating a phase transition? I think we're already in it. Um, that, that's my conjecture. I, I, you know, again, um, it's too soon to tell. But it, what I, this phase transition, I think, won't... It won't look like the sort of dot com one where we got a transition from a bunch of late industrial media companies slash computer companies to a new bunch that you know became the social media company of Facebook, Google, blah, blah, blah. Right. That was a clear um, a whole bunch of companies got replaced by a new bunch of companies and we called it a new era. I don't think that was a new era at all. That was that was just late stage, more of the same, just just different people at the same party. Um, I think we're actually in a transition now. And the reason we're in a transition now is, is, is that we can't tell, we're getting confused about what, what you know, I can't see the new thing precisely um, because the new thing isn't like the old thing. The new thing is a bunch of weird new stuff that is, it's not, um, it's not guarded by, by IP. It's not guarded by um, the sort of corporate structure and there's places that you expect to see it. It didn't float on the, on the, on, on NASDAQ, um, it, it didn't come from the usual places. And I think that's what's confusing people. Um, but, you know, you recognize that it's as the continuation is, this looks more like open source software, but massively powered up and, and, and doing interesting, weird new stuff other than just, so and again, but this is, this is sort of my conjecture about the nature of the transition, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm nowhere near smart enough to sort of to, to, you know, to have a general theory of what that is and when it's going to happen. But I, my point was just, I think that's the interesting research question right now, or the interesting hypothesis to try and theorize and, and understand. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
there is uh, still more and Mike. If you... no. Okay, I will try now to formulate a question because before I can comment. Well, uh, going back to the history of Marx, uh, yeah, actually I was thinking, uh, my question is, why so much art is in the center of, um, of now on the um, blockchain and crypto? Well, I can go back into the history and I can think that art was always finding patrons, like uh, in the Middle Ages was church and, and the kings who has the capital. And now, and now the new capital is, um, is the, the, the crypto. Uh, and and maybe, maybe that is why, but I don't, I, I mean, I mean, like I said, I mean, one, one, one foot, I still don't understand if this is like, um, um, how the direction is going, maybe like you're saying, like I, 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 I see, I have like um, at least one friend that got millionaire um, as, an, as an artist. I, I know other people that got millionaire, like uh, one artist that, uh, uh, top here last year uh, is definitely millionaire, um, but um, I am not. In this <laughs> um, but uh, just like um, why why art is in the center of this blockchain? Because actually, if you think about what you can buy in crypto right now, of course you can transfer into money. But what you can buy directly in crypto, probably the more expensive thing you can buy now are um, NFTs and crypto art. Uh, like in some millions of, of, of yeah. uh, whatever you can translate in dollars or, or, in, or, or in different currencies. But um, what do you think that this is like? I, I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, this isn't my natural, my, this isn't something I've looked deeply into. It's, it's, I'm a bit, I have a superficial understanding of this. Um, but the, this, the interesting thing I, that, that, that has struck me about this is, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to just take a thing, digitize it, and you know, and you know, people like like Beeple, you know, have, have done very well out of that. Um, I think that's the least interesting part of the story. I think the most interesting part is actually experiments like um, Dada out of New York City, um, which is an artist's collective. And what was interesting about what they did, the experiment, the, the, the Dada experiment, not Dada as in the you know early 20th century thing, but data the, the the new york arts collective now um is that what they were using crypto and blockchain for was essentially to comment on each other's work it was a it was a new way of building a sort of online community collective now they probably could have done that with other with other you know internet technologies it's, it might not have been essentially a crypto thing but what just what was interesting was that that was the use case that was sort of driving the innovation there was was actually the a new way to design a digital arts collective for group production of art not the how do i digitize and sell my art um so i, I and you know, I, I think i think that's interesting that that was that was the way in which the 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 technology was was used and deployed which is why, why i was pointing to that um not as a how do i financialize my thing um but how do i how do i use this technology to facilitate working collectively better together. Um, I mean, the, the, other, the point to note about that is that what, what, what that is, is that's blockchain being used as a sequential record keeping technology. When, when a group of people were collectively working on the same thing, it was blockchain just to keep track of who did what when, not as a way of creating a digital financial asset. Um, and again, that's, that, I think that's interesting. I have a follow-up question regarding this. Uh, so I, I, what, let me, let me wait, comment one thing. Like I, I actually uh, been engaged with people of blockchain for longer than, than this, the last year. Like uh, I was in um, Open Code, an exhibition in, in um, ZKM that is actually the first museum that had collect crypto art. And, and I was with the Crypto Kitties people on, I think was 17. And I have um, I have one crypto kitty that they gave me as a present when I met him. Uh, I met them, um, and I I I I, I got with beers with them, and they actually explained me that they they got money from the the blockchain people uh, to slow down uh, because they were at the moment breaking the blockchain because yeah, of yeah. selling the, the the crypto kitties. Um, and and the thing is that. Um, I still, I own, I said I own two crypto kids, I think. Um, 
I still don't understand what to do with this. You know, like uh, I, I have the Crypto Kitties and I don't know how they work. Uh, I, I, don't well, know. I know that one is okay. special because they gave me a special one, but I still don't know what to what, what to do with this. Um, well, I mean, the answer is sort of nothing. Like they were an experiment that, that I think everyone was very hopeful it would be amazing. It turned out to be the one thing that they did wrong was that they didn't have a finite quantity of them. The next generation of the experiment was board ape yacht club type things um which are worth 10 million dollars each right so it was um i also have a crypto kitty that is it is that is worthless um but it, again it's just you know this is an experimental technology that was that the crypto kitties was the very first use case of or one of the very very early use cases of that um and again um you know it could have gone either way but yeah so Sorry. the follow-up question is Yes. Um, art is not an investment it's a it's an escape strategy if you got money right so if you look at what patrons and donors are doing they all are afraid some centuries or millennia mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you know they all die like every one of us and then they will die and they will be forgotten and so they look at other people who do awesome stuff uh, so what is the chance to actually be remembered forever in a good way and let's say you sell shitloads of weapons and tens of thousands of people die and you made a lot of money or you looted the hell out of something and you have a lot of money. So what you do is you create an art collection um, in the hope that this will sort of be eternal value um, in its sort of like um, combination. Obviously every art collector, this is a very polemic sort of like almost satirical view Sarah Silverman would do, I guess. Um, where obviously everybody would say, oh, I'm collecting this because I, I, I like it a lot. But isn't the, his, the hysteria of going into NFT art um, also and is trying to escape the massive fluctuation of like bare Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies? So is it, is it that people have this vision or almost like religious belief that whatever you buy here will have value in the future because it has aesthetic value mm. that is sort of like other people think is good too or or is this really sort of like something where we create value or is, or is it the old thing of like saying oh i want to sort of yeah. like raise my my importance i don't know i mean i i think the i mean all of that is 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 a plausible theory of, of, of what could be going on here but the the one thing I would add to this is this is the first sort of digitally native generation of art that has that, that has permanence on the internet as opposed to is just transmitted through or is digital so there's a I mean so what I think the value proposition there is is, is actually the, the the firstness of it um, regardless of you know the aesthetic, not the aesthetic qualities of us, or the timelessness of us, or the the even the name of the artist, but just this was the stuff that was first. It's 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 of historical interest, I think, um, possibly more. But um, again, I I'm neither an art historian nor um, nor an artist, so um, yeah. I, but I, I so I, I think the. The things that are highly valuable right now just seem to have that characteristic of being of being sort of first plus scarce um, which which so which were first but they weren't scarce which um, is brutal inequality in yeah, actors isn't yeah. it oh absolutely yeah i mean yes completely okay um, mike uh okay I, I have essentially a couple of sort of political comments on on several things which have been said uh, number one, I you say that people are sick and tired of uh, big companies profiteering from them and harvesting their data. I seriously, I, I, I would like to understand what's the evidence for that. For number one thing, I in general I would say that people don't bother if somebody who is giving them a valuable service is profiteering from that. I, I have no problem with, with my corner shop profiteering from, from me buying groceries there, or I have no problems from uh, ear company profiteering from me flying from, from work to, 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 to where my mother lives or whatever. Uh, 
the situation is less clear uh, uh, about uh, data harvesting. I think people, uh, to some extent, understand that something going is going on. They don't understand what exactly is going on, and that is, to some extent, annoying. But I, I would say that from from what I see that most annoyance with 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 big tech companies is concentrated neither in data collection nor in not at all in profiteering but but in censorship and uh, regulation and manipulation of what sort of data is accessible through through the channels controlled by by Facebook by Apple by whoever. Uh, that is sort of indeed a problem, and and, and I, I think there is some sort of motivation in the public to to. to it's speak. the same thing. It's, those are identical things. Um, that sort of censorship and control is that's what data harvest. I mean, that's that's just two sides of the same coin. Um, and it's not just companies; it's governments do this as well. But um, you know, my ability to censor your access to my platform is my ability to harvest your data. It's it's the same object. Um, and it's just uh, I think people. Uh, I'm realize. sorry, I, 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 I genuinely don't understand what you just said. Um, the so I, I guess yeah. What I mean by data harvesting is the surveillance aspect. Is the ability to deplatform you or to, to 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 deny you access to a thing. Um, because I know who you are, I know when you're accessing, accessing it. So um, that that ability to on-sell your data, um, the right that you've granted me by using this platform, is also my right as a platform holder to, to deny you access to it. Um, it's the same thing. So you know, now, uh, that, uh, all, all the, all, uh, anyway, all these things can be can be regulated. It is. It it is more or less. No, I mean, they 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 can be regulated in a country. Um, they cannot be regulated globally. So, um, not, you know, I, I, yeah. But I'm it's I, yeah. But I, I I think this is. I mean, but this is the this is the these are the debates, right? This 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 notion of um, business models for platforms, mm -hmm. um, the acceptability of privacy, the regulation of privacy. Who decides that? Is it is it the government? Is it the EU? Is it the um, do I in Australia have to? I mean, I we in Australia have to comply with EU privacy law. This is something that that um, that's exactly of an example of how how it can be regulated globally. Yeah, but that's not a good thing. That's a, that's I'm I'm not a citizen of the EU, but somehow you're governing me. Um, that's not a. That's uh, a, as a it, well, well, maybe maybe in, in Australian case it may be not that. Not that. Uh, but me personally, as a citizen of Russia, I would rather prefer to be regulated by EU regulations. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, sorry, I, actually, I'm, 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 on this. I'm, I'm just sort of saying that I think there's a, you know, political regulation is good when it is good. Um, it is good when we when we trust our government that is doing it and, and it, it reflects democratic ideals. Um, but we can also regulate with tech, and I, I think it's just we just also have that option. That's that's my point. Not that. Not that this is a better solution than than. than yeah, yeah, well, well ba ba basically there is there's a, a lot of issues there and and, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, space for 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 reasonable regulation in very various, various things. That's the other question. And another comment I wanted to make is concerning the the uh, web two zero, uh, which is well. Whatever company is is in the end profiteering of this thing, and actually, and actually, when when it is when it is started, it was a, it was a collection of many, many, many small companies and many small startups, as in a way which is similar to what you to the way you are describing describing the blockchain world, and, and that it it is. Uh, I, I don't think it is any problem that that it is starting with many small things, uh, but uh, Web 2.0, well, for 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 me, for many people of my generation, for for uh, uh, for, for for many people around the world at the time, it it, it really changed uh, the uh, the life. Yes. Mm -hmm. It it really changed the life, especially in in the in the in the way uh, you are 
sort of selling the blockchain thing uh, in in making uh, forming groups much more easier in 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 creating a lot of horizontal connections between distant people and uh, with with all these things like uh, from uh, blogs to 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 uh, uh, per, uh, to to private messengers to I don't know dating apps to whatever all all this world of of people directly communicating with each other and so, it very rapidly involved very many people. Yeah. Uh, what I see in the blockchain world so far, it is number one people who want to speculate and earn a lot of money for free. Number two, people who, for good or bad reasons, need to make uh, uh, financial transactions which are not untractable, which are untractable. And number three, maybe uh, art and some other p places where indeed the, 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 the market normally is broken and these things sort of creates a new market. Uh, but my feeling is that that apart from 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 these very small groups of people it, it 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 is not penetrating much but i might be wrong and i would like you to comment yeah look, i mean just on, on that point i mean i think that was true sort of 2017 2018 um mm -hmm. the and you know that like the like that that group of speculators and criminals is clearly there they've all they were there right at the start they're still there now um but that's not where the growth is coming from that the growth i mean is... i mean not only criminals I, I i do i do claim that there are fair cases when it is when you right. need to yeah. make the the the, but the, the, you know, the 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 people using it for its um ability to to, mm -hmm. to mask transactions and to mm -hmm. hide um, like that's that was there at the start it's still there now but that's not what that's not what where the growth is um so i mean so i think it is i think it is moving <coughs> that, um, powerfully but the, the other point I'll, I'll make back to your original point so i i agree with you web 2 was amazing because mm -hmm. it enabled new groups to form as a communications technology um, it was blogs it was tweets it was it was a community so we could communicate together web 3 i mean is when we can start to create value together by contracting and organizing and, and doing things. So it's, I mean, I, I, I just see, if, I don't see web three as a, um, a you know, antithesis of web two or going back against it, or it's, it's not, it's just continuing that trend, but extending it beyond communication to um, economic infrastructure contracting. Like, so the same enthusiasm I have for, you know, web two is also amazing for me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm super excited about Web3 for the same reasons, because it takes that and just takes it beyond just a communications network into a value network. Um, all right. Um, I, I would like to emphasize one point that emerged in the discussion, which I think is really important, which is uh, this issue of regulation. And obviously, if we don't think about um, you know, regulation as in like GDPR or whatever, but regulation in general, uh, so the, these people that um, Mike was talking about that want to speculate, earn money for free and like hide their money and stuff like that. So if that is what is enabled, we're enabling arbitrariness and arbitrariness can be misused to enrich yourself and hurt other people. So one of the key issues, I think, and this is actually interesting in the light of the Cultural Science Journal, which um, something we, we obviously want to sort of like... Um, um, have a sustainable venue where uh, cultural science in the sense of John Hartley and Jason Potts can also live. But ideally, this should be the venue for cultural science in the broadest sense, including the cultural science nobody has invented yet. And one of the key issues there is exactly this issue of like, how is culture emerging? How is it governed? How is it regulated? How is it self-regulating? And so there is this, uh, you know, this goes back to our common root with semiotics and Kubernetes, self-organization, if this was a bottom-up thing, like if this would organize like ants crossing a gap between two tree trunks, um, then this would be nice, but that's not the case, right? There is, there is, there is people who are in very powerful position because they were first, who mm. have unbelievably amount, uh, unbelievable amounts of money, who can do whatever they want. And there is already sort of like the people who have already money, who have a much easier time doing that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I think we should, 
be very careful in in sort of like saying oh this is a democratic or you know it's like an equal technology it's similar to like giving everybody 100 euros at the beginning when the euro was introduced obviously those who already have millions will still have millions and those who only have nothing will have 100 euros and it will be spent in two weeks and so that is sort of something which i think is very important that um there is a messy transition happening and we need to understand it and this is exactly why we should also do that like uh why you made yeah. a major contribution putting the stuff together that is there um and not only is this whole uh development at the start but you know yeah. the, the whole the whole understanding of it is also at the start i think yeah. um can i just add a just to mm -hmm. straight, just to emphasize and echo that point i think that's a that's an incredibly important insight um the the role of regulation is 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 the hardest problem it is it is you know, the, the thing about the crypto space it is broadly unregulated and that's not a good thing because it creates mm -hmm. uncertainty no one knows what's going on it creates opportunities for 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 malicious activity um but i what i'd emphasize is i think it's not just regulation it's actually broader than that it's governance and um regulation is a type of governance it's 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 a governance sort of done through um, usually political and legislative mechanisms, but the, the broader context is, is a cultural science of governance of, of um, and, and, and governance then extends down to the sorts of norms and constitutional agreements that a group of people will make for their thing. So um, the biggest part of my research program going forward in the crypto space is governance. And what I mean by that isn't, is, is a, is a, is a thing that not just you know public regulation public governance but actually the the what i think is the, the more general phenomena of each of these small sort of startup communities deems requires governance and that governance can be off the shelf it can be copied from others that's the cultural transmission of governance it can be innovated and created um that's why i was emphasizing the role of those toolkits and DAOs and so on but i think we're we're at a and it's just to just to just to re-emphasize re your point. I think that is the single most important research question in this space um, that the cultural science should be focusing on is a cult, the sort of cultural science of governance broadly understood, including regulation, as as a as one of the sort of things. Um, so we promised you to yes. not go over an hour. <laughs> No, look, this has been fascinating. Well, we, we've I'm made it for two enjoying. hours and it's now uh, three in the morning in your place. Yeah. Um, so we got five minutes left. Um, if the, if Mark and Mar have a very, very brief question, we can still do it, I guess. Mark. I have a very brief uh, question. Mark was uh, first. Go ahead. Okay. Mark was first. <laughs> okay, well, I, I will quickly ask. So, I mean, it's it's got to do also with the, the problems of the possible problems. You mentioned already this... Uh, uh, kind of digital division idea, right? And Max mentioned that you know we start off on different levels just by our like uh, uh, what we have by now, money or etc. And and also, with, uh, so do you think how big of a problem it will be? Uh, do you think there will be a big community with people with financial and power disadvantage uh, as a result of this turn? And, yes, and, I do. Uh, yeah, but what yeah, should, I, what should we? What are the possible I, I things to do to avoid it? Actually, look, I. I, I think it's different. I mean, we, yes, um, first. Secondly, um, this is something that feels like education is part of the solution. Um, that this is, this is, I, you know, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's differences in allocation of, of material wealth, but I think the knowledge requirements to participate in this technology are the far bigger barrier and more important barrier. And, um, but what, what that means to me is not just education within a country, this is a global problem. And what I want to, what I'm most concerned about here is, and I mean, what we're doing at, at my university, the reason, the reason that well, one of the big motivations we've got is to put as much content online for free and push it out as possible, um, just to try and, you know, um, just how, you know, um, not so much financial literacy stuff, but just tech digital literacy around this and, and to treat that as a, as a significant problem that is not obviously going to be addressed by, individual governments um, or any, you know, I'm not sure who's trying to solve this problem, but, I, but I'm worried about this problem. Yeah. Mar. Yeah, I mean, you shared a lot to us and let, let's tell you something. We, we are in a study of um, analyzing the blockchain of Tezos, um, the NFTs, 
uh, basically. Um, basically, we are looking at the um, communication um, results on sellings and correlations and that. And yeah, something that you said uh, were, were pretty interesting. And maybe what do you think that we should look? We are looking now at uh, basically, we are looking at correlations between the sellings and the talks in Twitter. Which actually we we, uh, we find out that the, I mean I also because I'm in the blockchain the Twitter is the main um, social media where uh, NFTs are moved. This is like without doubt um, a part of like private discourse channel. Um, like that's how I had seen all the platforms. And yeah, uh, we we basically Tesos. I don't know if you you familiar, but it's, 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 uh, we are looking at heated norm. Um, they, they had appeared in several papers uh, from different in nature, and um, the last one, Barabasi, was in PNS. Oh, yeah. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Okay. Yeah, I'll let you to, to okay. maybe. Um, look, I mean, I've, that's an interesting question. Um, I've got a couple of people on my team who are doing actually very similar work. Um, where they, they're just using exchange data trying to understand that. But, but I think that, no, that there's a lot of just replicating um, existing financial studies in there. But I mean, to my mind, the, it's actually the big questions that we should be asking. You know, we're in a very, very early stage of a, what I believe to be a radic it's just radically new technology um, that will, will have a lot of um, transformative impact. And like, this is the time to actually sort of go back to big questions and at least to try and formulate them. Um, and part of the, you know, part of the thing that makes a question interesting is that it has specific predictions that can be tested or, um, you know, that it makes, um, you know, claims that we can sort of try and figure out whether we're right or wrong about these things. So, I mean, you know, to me, that's, that's kind of the vision of, of a cultural science here is actually to, to sort of take on big ambitious questions about these, these sorts of things. And you know, again, the reason, the reason this interests me is I'm worried about my own field economics failing at this because it's too narrow and it just, it just gets part of the, and just ignores whole sort of things. So um, that's, that's uh, yeah, I'll finish with that. Thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you, thank you for, yeah. for doing this. This was great and what yeah. a good end. Thank you very much. So right. this was the Open Lab seminar. Um, and let me say one word. Uh, there will be the Open Lab seminar uh, will return. And um, so I should have done this earlier. Um, but I can tell you we we're going to meet next week, um, which will be um, the um, February 28th, and it will be a lab encounter with Francesco Bonchi, Yamir Moreno, Ciro Catuto, and many, many others of the Institute for Scientific Interchange in Torino, which is, uh, for those who don't know this place, one of the places that is most similar in Europe to the Santa Fe Institute, uh, or basically super multidisciplinary Max Planck style stuff. And so they do data science for the social good, um, fueled by institutional philanthropy. So that is a very, very interesting topic too. Thank you very much. See you next week.